Investing in ETFs is a great and low cost way to build a diversified stock portfolio. And in this video, I talk about 10 ETFs that may be a good investment for 2022. Before I begin, a shout out to Kane Pepe from Stock Apps, whose article has provided most of this information. This isn't a sponsored endorsement, but Stock Apps looks like a great website for providing information on Australian trading platforms, applications, brokerage, and crypto trading apps. So be sure to check them out. ETFs, which stands for exchange traded funds, are a basket of lots of individual stocks or assets, which you can buy and sell on the ASX in a single trade. Most ETFs in Australia consist of tens or possibly even hundreds of companies, providing you with exposure to a highly diversified portfolio at a low cost. Because when you buy an ETF, you're effectively buying all of the shares that make up that particular ETF. And the price of the ETF is dictated by the value of those shares that make up the ETF. ETFs then therefore rise in value when their individual shares go up in value and also fall in value when the ETF shares go down in value. Most ETFs also pay out dividends which their underlying stocks pay to their shareholders. ETFs are also very easy to buy and sell because it's effectively just like buying and selling shares in individual companies. The only difference is that instead of clicking the buy button on dozens or potentially even hundreds of individual companies, in order to get a highly diversified portfolio, you're instead just buying all of those individual companies in a single trade. There are four main types of ETFs that are available to Australian investors, including index ETFs, sector ETFs, ETFs, inverse and leveraged ETFs, and dividend ETFs. Index ETFs are the most common ETF that are available to investors, and they just track a specific stock market index like the ASX 300 or the S&P 500 index in the US. These ETFs don't aim to outperform any particular market index, but rather they just provide the opportunity to invest in that particular market index. You can check out my other video here, which provides a full explanation of index funds. Now, a major advantage of indexed ETFs is that they don't require any expensive fund managers or financial professionals to research and select particular stocks that make up a particular ETF. Since they just passively track a stock market index, their management fees are very cheap. So for example, the Vanguard Australia Shares Index or the VAS has a management fee of only 0.1%. This means that if you invested $10,000 in this particular ETF, you would only be paying about $10 a year in management fees. However, if you instead invested in an actively managed fund ETF, which requires those expensive professionals to select those particular stocks, then you'd be paying about one to 2% in management fees. Meaning you could potentially be paying 100 or possibly even $200 a year just in management fees if you had invested $10,000 in an actively managed ETF. Sector ETFs allow you to invest in a particular market sector. So for example, the Vanek Gold Miners ETF lets you invest in gold mining companies, not just in Australia, but also in the US, South Africa, and other parts of the world. You can also invest, say, in the tech sector if you think that that particular sector is gonna outperform the market overall, such as the FANG ETF. However, just bear in mind that sector ETFs are more likely to have a higher management fee than indexed ETFs. So for example, the FANG ETF has a management fee of 0.35%, which is almost four times higher than the Vanguard's VAS ASX index ETF. Leveraged ETFs are specialized types of ETFs that amplify your exposure to the stock market by employing derivatives and taking on debt. These ETFs are designed with the aim of providing two to three times the return of the overall stock market. However, these types of ETFs are extremely risky because they can also amplify your losses when the share market declines. Therefore, most people only invest in these sorts of ETFs if they've got a short-term trading strategy. Otherwise, if you wanna bet against the ASX, then you can invest in the beta shares Australian Equity Strong Bear Hedge ETF. And finally, there are dividend ETFs, which just typically focus on investing in companies that consistently pay out high dividend yields. There are several advantages and disadvantages when it comes to trading ETFs. However, this ultimately just comes down to your own personal goals and your individual financial situation. The main advantage of investing in ETFs is that it provides you with exposure to a broad range of companies in a single trade. So instead of buying lots of individual stocks and pressing the buy button a hundred times, you can instead just have a highly diversified portfolio of individual stocks in a single trade. And diversification means that you are less likely to be impacted by the downturn in your portfolio if a single company goes down in value. Another advantage of ETFs is that you don't have to manually rebalance your portfolio whenever the price of your stocks change in value. If you buy and sell individual stocks, then you are responsible for managing and rebalancing your own portfolio and adjusting your exposure to certain companies and sectors. Since ETFs are managed by investment professionals, they are responsible for ensuring that 
the ETF tracks a specific stock market index or the particular market that it's meant to represent. Meaning that an ETF is more likely to remain balanced over time as the price of the individual companies change. Although bear in mind, this might not apply to all particular ETFs as there'll be some actively managed ETFs that don't aim to track a particular market index. The main disadvantage of ETFs is that it doesn't provide you with the same level of exposure to individual companies compared to if you were to just buy individual stocks. So for example, if you just bought Commonwealth Bank as an individual stock, back in March, 2020, you would have made a 75% gain. However, if you had instead bought the IOZ ETF, which just tracks the ASX 200, you would have only gained about 50% during this time. So when certain individual stocks go up in value, the ETF might only go up slightly, or it may even potentially go down if other individual stocks in the ETF go down in value. Therefore, if you think that your individual stocks are gonna do better than an ETF, then you may want instead consider investing in individual stocks instead. The second main disadvantage of ETFs is their management fee. Although they are often inexpensive, particularly the case with indexed ETFs, management fees can increase to about one to 2% for actively managed ETFs. So although you are technically saving on brokerage fees by instead just buying an ETF as opposed to individual stocks, you do have to pay management fees on a yearly basis which isn't the case if you buy just individual stocks. Now, later in this video, I do talk about whether it's worthwhile buying individual stocks or potentially buying just an ETF based on the brokerage and management fees. So now that you have an understanding of ETFs, let's have a look at my top 10 ETFs that I'm looking to invest in for 2022. So first up, we've got the Vanguard Australian Shares ETF, which mirrors the performance of the ASX 300. This just means it tracks the overall performance of the top 300 publicly listed companies in Australia. VAS has a 0.1% management fee and is at an average annual return of 9.5% since its inception in 2009. Now, due to the nature of the Australian economy, VAS is primarily weighted towards the financial and the material sectors. Financial services make up about 30% of the VAS ETF, with Commonwealth Bank making up about 8% of the weighting of the VAS ETF. Materials makes up a further 20% of this ETF, and that includes companies like BHP, which make up about 7% of this ETF. Therefore, although VAS is highly diversified amongst a range of Australian companies. Other sectors such as technology are underrepresented in this ETF and they make up only about 5%. VAS currently pays a distribution or dividend of $1.94 or $2.64 gross, meaning that they pay a yield of about 2.8%. Now, this is actually pretty low compared to their overall historical dividend payments. And as profits return to companies over the coming years, Personally, I think it's likely that the dividends will increase in value over time as well. The full historical average dividend yield for VAS is about 4.4%. Now, since VAS owns Australian companies, the dividends that it pay out are highly franked. The actual amount of franking credits that you will get from these dividends will obviously fluctuate, but on average, it comes out to around 75%. The dividends have historically been paid quarterly in January, April, July, and October. The main competitor of VAS is the new BetaShares A200 ETF, which only has a management fee of 0.07%. There's also STW and IOZ, although note that these ETFs track the ASX 200, or the top 200 companies on the ASX, as opposed to the VAS, which tracks the top 300 companies on the ASX. Now, the difference between all of these ETFs in terms of their performance and their management fees is pretty similar. Now, personally, I hold a large proportion of my portfolio in just passively managed ETFs because of a large body of research and data which shows that index funds almost always outperform managed funds in the long term. So for example, Standard & Poor's conducted a study on the performance of active versus passive index funds and found that more than 80% of actively managed funds have failed to outperform the ASX 200. The report states that actively managed funds underperform benchmarks over short and long-term periods, which is true as well across most countries and regions. And although certain active funds have been shown to outperform an index in the short term, they have usually failed to outperform an index over a much longer time period. The report also talks about how this trend also applied to mid and small cap funds, international funds, bond funds, and real estate investment trust funds. Link to the report is in the description of this video. It's also important to remember that these managed funds charge a much higher fee, meaning that you could potentially be in a situation where you're not only underperforming an indexed stock market, you're also paying higher management fees as well, resulting in even greater bottom line underperformance. Next up is the Vanek Sector 
Australian Equal Weighting ETF or MVW, which seeks to track the returns of the MVIS Australian Equal Weight Index. So this fund aims to capture the true performance of the Australian stock market with different levels of diversification across various companies and sectors. So for example, materials and financials don't even make up 40% of this ETF compared to their combined holding of 50% for VAS. And this is because it applies a greater weighting to other sectors such as IT, which make up about 7%. The ETF has a total of 102 holdings and a management fee of 0.35%. Meaning that if you invested $10,000, you'd be paying about 35 bucks a year in management fees. Now this is five times larger than the BetaShares A200 ETF, which only has a management fee of 0.07%. This ETF has returned about 10.5% on average per year over the last five years, which is actually better than the ASX 200, which has returned on average about 8.7% per year. And that's assuming all dividends are reinvested. However, this certainly doesn't indicate that MVM is going to outperform the ASX 200 over the longer term and in the future. Also, particularly given the fact that you're paying much higher management fees. To put this into perspective, $10,000 invested into MVW in 2014 would have grown to over $18,000 by 2020 with all dividends reinvested. Whereas 10K invested into the ASX 200 would have only returned about $16,000 over that same time period. Now, according to Comsec, MVW pays a dividend yield of about 2.5% and it's ranked at about 60%. If you are considering investing in this ETF, just remember that this isn't a typical market weighted ETF because it's more heavily weighted towards smaller industries and therefore smaller companies because the holding isn't necessarily based on capitalization. And also just remember that past performance isn't indicative of future performance. The third ETF is the iShares MSCI Emerging Markets ETF or IEM. The IEM ETF doesn't hold any Australian shares, but instead invests in companies that are in emerging markets such as China, Southeast Asia, and India. The purpose of this ETF is to invest in the largest companies in these sorts of emerging markets with the belief that they have more room to grow than established companies in other markets such as the US, Canada, and Australia. China makes up the largest holding of this ETF at 38%, followed by Korea, Taiwan, and then India. And in terms of sector breakdown, IT makes up about 20% of this ETF, followed by consumer discretionary at 18%, and then financials at about 17%. So together, these three sectors make up about 56% of the ETF. In terms of individual companies, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Group makes up about 7% of the ETF, followed by Tencent Holdings at 6 6%, Alibaba Group at about 5.9%, and then Samsung Electronics at 4.4%. Now, now, interestingly, the weighted percentage of the remaining companies drops quite sharply at this point, to the point where the 10th largest holding, Ping and Insurance Group, makes up 0.8% of the ETF. So taken together, the top 10 companies make up just about 30% of the total weighting of this particular ETF, which is actually much larger than the MSCI World Index, in which the top 10 holdings make up about 17% of that index. Now, most of these holdings are also Chinese companies, so the returns on this ETF is likely also gonna be impacted by the overall performance of the Chinese stock market as well. So over the last five years, the fund has returned on average about 10.5% per year. However, the management fee for this ETF is 0.68%. So taking that into account, it's not really surprising that it's technically underperformed against its benchmark. These sorts of emerging market ETFs are also exposed to additional risks such as political upheaval and natural disasters. If you are considering investing in these sorts of ETFs, then another possibility is VGS, which tracks the performance of the MSCI World Index. So this will provide you to exposure to both developed and also emerging markets at a much lower management fee of 0.18%, which is almost four times smaller than the management fee of IEM. Another ETF that you can consider, particularly if you wanna buy US stocks, is the Vanguard US Total Stock Market Index ETF, or VTS. VTS provides Australian investors with exposure to some of the largest companies in the US, and it has one of the smallest management fees on the ASX. VTS is made up of over 4,000 companies, so it provides investors with a great opportunity to diversify into the US and out of the Australian stock market. So investing in this ETF will also give you exposure to companies such as Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, 
Tesla and Berkshire Hathaway. The top 10 holdings are all household names and make up roughly a quarter of this ETF. It also has diversification into other sectors, including a 15% allocation in consumer discretionary, about 14% in industrials, 13% in healthcare, and about 10% in financials. The ETF also pays a dividend yield of about 1.2%. Since its inception, this ETF has returned an average of about 17% per year and about 20% per year over the last 10 years. That being said, this ETF is not hedged against the Australian dollar. So the ETF is exposed to fluctuations in the US currency. So therefore, the best time to buy this particular ETF is when the value of the US dollar is low against the Australian dollar, and the best time to sell the ETF is when the value of the US dollar is high against the Australian dollar. Just remember though, that if you're investing in multiple ETFs, then you may actually end up investing twice in the same company. So for example, if you bought NDQ, which tracks the NASDAQ 100, and you also bought VTS, then you're likely gonna have overlapping investments in many companies. Now, the fifth ETF is the BetaShares NASDAQ 100 or NDQ ETF. The NASDAQ 100 comprises of the top 100 largest non-financial companies that are listed on the NASDAQ market. Now, the NASDAQ has a strong focus on technology, so it provides investors with the opportunity to invest in some of the largest tech companies in the world, and particularly those which are underrepresented in the Australian market. And this is because technology stocks only make up about 10% of the ASX 200 slash 300, whereas IT makes up almost half of the NDQ ETF. So you do get exposure to the largest American tech companies, including Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Tesla, which collectively make up about 40% of this ETF. Beta shares, like any ETF, is very easy to buy. Just search for NDQ on Comsec and buy as many units as you require. The great thing about this ETF is that there's no additional requirement for any paperwork to complete in order to buy US shares as an Australian citizen. You just simply buy the ETF on the ASX. That being said, the management fee is 0.48%, meaning that if you invested $10,000, you'd be paying about $48 a year in management fees. Since its inception, NDQ has returned about 24% on average per year and 28% on average per year over the last five years. It also pays dividends as well. And in July last year, it paid a dividend yield of about four and a half percent. Now the risk with NDQ, again, is that it isn't hedged against the US dollar. So exchange rate fluctuations between the AUD and the USD are also gonna impact the price of this ETF. So if you're worried about currency exposure, then another option could be HNDQ, which is effectively just the same as NDQ, but it's hedged against the Australian dollar, meaning that any effect on currency fluctuations on the price of the ETF is minimized. However, the management cost for this ETF is slightly higher at 0.51%. The next ETF is the beta shares Australia Strong Bear Hedge ETF or BBOZ. Now this ETF essentially just allows you to bet against the ASX when you go to buy it. So unlike other ETFs in this video, this ETF actually goes up in value when the price of the ASX goes down and vice versa. So you can see it hasn't performed very well over the last five years, which is really just due to the strength of the Australian economy and the ASX performing very well over the last five years as well. That being said, unless you sign up for specific brokerage platforms, it's pretty difficult to short or bet against companies on the ASX. You certainly can't do this through Comsec. So therefore, if you think that the ASX is going to fall in value, then it may be an easier option to instead just buy this ETF as opposed to finding a brokerage platform that allows you to short stocks or ETFs. Now, of course, Based on historical performance, the ASX is probably gonna increase in the long run in the future. So personally, it would only make sense to buy this ETF if you're looking to do some sort of short-term buy and sell strategy. You're also paying a very hefty 1.3% management fee, which means that if you invested $10,000 in this ETF, you would be paying $138 per year in management fees. It also doesn't pay out any dividends. Seventh ETF is the SPDR S&P Global Dividend ETF, or the WDIV, which has one of the highest dividend yields out of all ETFs in Australia, obviously excluding leveraged or covered call ETFs. This ETF 
is primarily for Australian dividend investors and it consists of 94 companies and has a dividend yield of about 5%. Now, since its inception, the ETF has returned about 7.5% per year on average. And that's assuming that the dividends are reinvested. So this ETF is sold to investors as something which isn't really going to provide capital gains, but rather just consistently pay out high dividend yields because it's invested in certain stocks around the globe, including Exxon Mobile, Smart Centers, H&R Block, Japan Tobacco, and Power Asset Holdings. The management fee is 0.5%, which it justifies in the product disclosure statement by stating that the fund only invests in companies with increasing or stable dividends for at least 10 consecutive years. Now, you'll also get exposure to other international markets, including Canada, US, Japan, and the UK, as Australia, only makes up about 1% of the overall weighting of this ETF. Just bear in mind though, that you're unlikely to get any franking credits if you invest in this ETF, as the Australian government only provides franking credits to Australian investors who have invested in Australian companies that have therefore paid tax to the Australian government. And after paying that tax, the dividends are therefore paid onto Australian investors who therefore get a tax credit from the government because those companies have already paid tax to it before paying the money out to investors. If you're looking exclusively for an Australian ETF, then another option could be the iShares S&P ASX 20 ETF or ILC. And this is an ASX ETF that tracks the top 20 companies listed on the Australian share market. So with this ETF, you're essentially just investing in the big four banks, plus a couple of other household names. So more than 25% of this ETF consists just of CBA and CSL. And another 25% consists of BHP, Westpac, and NAB. The fund has slightly underperformed the ASX 300 over the last five years, delivering an average annual return of 10.9%, compared to about 11% for the ASX overall. Now, this ETF also has a management fee of 0.24%, which is almost three times the size of the BetaShares A200 ETF, which only has a management fee of 0.07%. It does have a dividend yield of about 3.5%. And since you're buying Australian shares, you are getting franking credits on these as well. Now, since this ETF only consists of 20 companies, then it may be worthwhile considering actually just buying those individual companies instead, as opposed to buying an ETF. So if you bought each of these 20 stocks individually, then you would end up paying about $200 just in brokerage fees to buy those shares, assuming that you're paying less than $1,000 per share. However, if you just bought the ETF, then the cost to buy that ETF assuming you invested the same amount of money, would probably cost about $20 to $30 in brokerage fees. However, you'd then be paying an additional $24 a year to own that ETF because of the management fees, which you wouldn't have to pay if you just bought the individual stocks. So if you had owned that ETF for about seven years, then the total cost to acquire those single stocks would come out to be about the same as if you had bought the ETF. However, you'd also then be paying brokerage fees when you go to sell those single stocks as well, which would likely result in total brokerage fees of about $400 and possibly even more if the price of those shares go up in value. So therefore, assuming everything else is equal to justify buying individual stocks over say an ETF, you'd need to be willing to hold them for at least 15 years. Anything less and you're potentially just better off just buying the ETF instead. The second last ETF is the Vanek Gold Miners ETF or GDX. This ETF invests in 55 of the largest gold mining companies, not just in Australia, but also worldwide, including Newcrest, Northern Star and Evolution Mining. Some mining companies have done really well over the last five years, including Fortescue Metal Group, which has gained about 225% over the last five years. BHP has also increased by about 65% during this time, and that excludes dividends as well. So this gold ETF has returned on average about 5.5% per year over the last five years. Management fee for GDX is 0.51%. Gold has been argued as a way to hedge against the stock market. And you can see that because gold rose significantly during 2020, when the share market crashed. Now, instead of just buying gold, you could instead potentially consider investing in gold mining companies, such as those which are covered by this particular ETF, if you plan on hedging against the stock market. Now, hear me out on this last ETF, Beta Shares Australia High Interest Cash ETF, or AAA. This Beta Shares ETF just primarily invests in cash. 
So since it's just investing really in cash and bonds, it's only returned an average of about one and a half percent per year over the last five years. This ETF is essentially the same as just putting your money into a high interest savings account. Since this ETF owns nothing but just cash at major banks, which in turn just means high levels of capital stability. This ETF pays dividends every month, which is similar to putting your money into a high interest savings account and receiving interest every month as well. So the advantage of buying this ETF is that you don't have to chase bonus introductory rates with savings accounts every two to three months. So instead of having to switch a savings account after an introductory bonus rate expires, you can instead just buy this ETF and get the interest rate from it. It's currently trading at about $50 a share and pays out about a cent per share every month. So you could potentially consider this ETF Otherwise, you can always just go with a savings account that pays one to two percent. There's always the Westpac savings account, which currently offers a four month introductory rate of about two and a half percent. But this is only up to thirty thousand dollars and you need to make five eligible purchases a month and you need to be aged 18 to 29. Those are the top ETFs that I'm considering buying in 2022. Now, if I personally just had to pick one of these ETFs, then I'd be looking to buy the Vanguard US Total Market Shares ETF or VTS to eventually add to my portfolio. Reason being is because this is one of the cheapest ETFs on the ASX in terms of management fees. And it's also delivered an average annual return of about 20% over the last 10 years. Now, although this past performance certainly isn't indicative of future performance, personally, I think that the US stock market is just going to keep rising next year in 2022, despite all the fears of the correction rising inflation and rising interest rates. But that's the topic for another video. If you enjoyed watching this video, I'd like to know what are your favorite ETFs and why? Leave a comment down below and be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Thanks so much for watching.